Hello everyone. My name is Zoran Kokwara and I am the director of enterprise sales at Kososis. I've been with Kososis for over 12 years in various roles. I started out with some technical roles, then moved into sales, but I promise this will not be a sales presentation. So don't leave just yet, because we are going to talk about some interesting stuff. Our main topic is what to consider when looking to implement a data loss prevention solution. For those of you who are not familiar with DLP, the purpose of a data loss prevention solution is to minimize internal data loss, data theft, and data leakage. As a Cososis employee, I have access to a ton of confidential data. Some of this data was produced by me over the years, but I also have access to a list uh, of customers using our solution. How much they paid? Who are the decision makers? I have access to technical documents that are for internal use only, and so on. If one day I decide to leave Cososis and start a new job at a competitor of ours, the information that I have access to could be very valuable at my new job. So before I leave, I might try to copy some of this data to a USB drive, send it out to my personal email, or just upload it to my personal Dropbox or Google Drive accounts. This is where a DLP solution comes in. It can prevent a malicious user like me to exfiltrate this type of data. Now, for the record, I am not planning to go anywhere and steal any data from my employer. This was just an example to help you all understand what a DLP is used for. Some of the data leaks happen accidentally. Some of them are caused by malicious users, uh, as in the earlier example but an effective DLP tool should protect the organization in both of those situations. The problem is that DLP solutions have a very poor reputation. Many system administrators, IT managers, or even CISOs try to avoid DLP solutions as much as possible. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Mac admins Slack community. I might not be very active uh, contributor on the workspace, but I follow certain security and especially DLP related channels. I also have an alert set up every time uh, someone mentions data loss prevention or DLP on any Mac admins channel. Many times the first reaction when someone is asking for a DLP recommendation is this. Anyone using a DLP they are actually happy with? I will gladly help you argue against DLP. It's my hobby. All EDR DLP SAC agents are really not that intuitive, nor are they lightweight. I have used several DLP solutions and they are all pretty much garbage. So the big question is how do we change this perception? As a DLP vendor, we can try, for example, by building better Mac DLP products that offer a superior experience to the end users and to the administrators managing it. Or maybe by building products designed for Mac OS and not adapting Windows code to Mac OS. And of course, by listening to the customer base using the product. In order to minimize the frustration and friction caused by a DLP implementation, I would like to present next seven key elements to take into consideration when choosing a DLP provider. Let's dive in. Zero day support. This is the number one challenge of every Mac administrator. We all know that uh, every fall, Apple is going to release a new version of its operating system named after a landmark in California. We also know that agent-based solutions like DLP tools will need to make changes to the agent in order to work on the new operating system. So why aren't most of the DLP vendors supporting the new operating system day one? The simple answer is because they don't care, because it's not a priority for them. Windows has uh, over 75% market share in the enterprise, Mac less than 15%. No wonder that uh, DLP vendors focus most of their efforts on Windows and there are very few companies that offer zero-day support for macOS. These are typically niche products that you won't necessarily find in the top right corner of the Gartner Magic Quadrant, but they do exist. There are a couple of reasons why zero-day support is important. 
Many companies use Macs to develop applications and tools for iOS or macOS. These tools have to be ready for release and compatible with the latest OS version as soon as the new operating system becomes available. But if you can't upgrade to the new OS because the antivirus or the DLP solution is not working on it, developers cannot work and test their application on the new operating system. So it's not a matter of being an early adopter or being cool. Having zero-day support can have a huge business impact on the organization. So when looking for a DLP solution, you better add this to the top of your requirements list. The second point to consider when looking for a DLP solution is to make sure that the vendor is leveraging Apple's latest technologies. I remember the concerns many vendors had when Apple announced deprecating the kernel extension a couple of years ago. Everybody just panicked. We also thought that without the kernel extension, we will lose some of the DLP features we have in our product. But actually, that wasn't the case. On the contrary, after rebuilding our agent using Apple's endpoint security framework, we ended up having a more stable agent and introduced some more granularity in terms of detection. As an example, with the kernel extension, we could monitor and scan data copied from the computer to USB drives. With the endpoint security framework, we can now monitor not just outgoing data, but also incoming data, files copied from the USB to a computer. Building a universal installer and supporting the M1 and M2 chips is another example that just makes sense for vendors to do as soon as possible as it enhances the performance of the agent. Just last week, I learned that one of the well-known DLP vendors finally has an agent that supports M1 processors. That is two years after Apple released M1 and two months after Apple already released M2. But perhaps the best example is Apple's vision framework that performs image and text detection. In the DLP world, text detection is crucial and every DLP vendor does a good job when it comes to Word and other editable files. But what happens when you have to extract the text from a graphic file? Well, things become a lot more complicated because you have to use something called Optical Character Recognition or OCR. Performing OCR is not an easy task. It is an extremely resource-intensive process, and it also comes with limitations, meaning that the graphic file needs to have a certain resolution for the engine to successfully extract the text. This is why most vendors prefer to license an OCR technology and then embed it into their product. How do you think these OCR technologies perform compared to Apple's vision framework? Let's see a quick test done by uh, one of our developers. We took four images with very, very low resolution, containing the words stickler, spearfish, unsurprising, and revamped. And then we tried to extract the text from the images. On the left-hand side, we've used Apple's Vision API. On the right side, a commercial OCR solution that vendors can license and embed it into their products. The Vision API managed to successfully extract the text from all four images in milliseconds, which is quite impressive taking into consideration the low resolution of the images. The other OCR solution, well, not so much. Instead of stickler, the other uh, solution found a five and a pipe. Instead of spearfish, it detected the number 13, a T, and fish. Instead of unsurprising, it detected kill again, which I don't know, might be French for unsurprising. And then instead of revamped, it found an M and an N. Considering these results, it just makes using the vision framework a no brainer. A vendor will know about all this cool stuff if they have a strong relationship with Apple and listen to the Apple community. To leverage what the endpoint security framework provides can be done only if vendors invest time and resources to study the documentation and if they have dedicated Mac developer teams. 
Despite of what some people say, Apple is seeking feedback from the developer community because Apple is a for-profit organization. Apple's market share in the enterprise will not grow if companies cannot be compliant with regulatory requirements and protect their sensitive data from external and internal threats. So Apple has a direct interest for DLP, EDR, SSO, and other type of solutions and acronyms to work on Macs. Apple's success selling more Macs in the enterprise space depends a little bit on our success as well. Also, if you go to three, four Apple events like JNOC every year, and you don't see the vendors you work with at any of these events, it's most likely that Mac support is not really a priority for them. A lightweight agent. This is what every client is asking for and every DLP vendor claims to have, a lightweight agent. Why is this important though? A DLP agent is designed to scan files, to scan data. Some DLP solutions scan not just data in motion, but also data at rest and even data in use. If the DLP agent is utilizing too many resources for scanning, it can have a performance impact on the computer, slowing it down and impacting the user's productivity, creating frustration. The only way to have a lightweight agent though, with a small footprint, is to build it on Apple's guidelines we talked about earlier. Adapting Windows code to macOS is not really going to work. Monitor cloud applications and physical devices. When people talk about DLP, they automatically think about monitoring browser traffic, emails, cloud applications, file sharing applications, or maybe instant messaging applications. And they are right. Nowadays, we spend most of our time using some sort of cloud service, and DLP solutions have to make sure that users are not sharing sensitive data with the wrong recipients, and they don't exfiltrate data to their personal email, Google Drive, or maybe Dropbox accounts. Besides all these cloud services, DLP solutions should be able to also control and monitor physical devices like USB drives, SD cards, smartphones, or printers. This is why for an effective DLP strategy is not enough to monitor only internet-based egress channels, but also physical devices. So when you are looking for a DLP solution, make sure that it also has a device control component that will allow you to block the devices and ports that shouldn't be used while monitoring data transfers to devices added to an exception list. Believe it or not, people still use USB drives. They still copy data to these drives and they still lose devices putting their organizations at risk. Just less than three months ago, a gentleman from Japan went out for drinks after work. He had one too many, fell asleep, and by the time he woke up, his bag was gone and so were the half a million records on a USB stick containing names, birth dates, and addresses. If a DLP would have been prevented him from copying the data to a USB, or at least forced him to encrypt the data, there wouldn't be a story on it today. False positives, the worst nightmare of every DLP analyst. How to determine if an incident is really cause for concern or if it's just another false positive? The ugly truth is that DLP solutions have false positives, all of them, without exception. The best thing you can do is to minimize and reduce false positives as much as possible. There are a couple of detection techniques you can utilize in order to minimize false positives. So you should make sure that these are available in the DLP solution that you choose. Contextual detection rules will allow you to add context to the sensitive data you are protecting. The easiest example is if you are looking to prevent uh, social security numbers from leaving the organization, then also look for some keywords in the proximity of the numbers like social security, social security numbers, SSN, and so on. This way, not every nine digit number will be flagged by the DLP policy. 
Applying policies based on location, on the network or off the network are other good examples for contextual detection. Thresholds, another good way to limit false positives. Going back to the social security numbers example, if you have a document with one social security number and the document leaves the organization, it probably won't cause your data breach. But if you have a document with 50 or 100 social security numbers, now that is a different story. So you can play around with the thresholds and adjust them based on the company's risk tolerance. Boolean operators can also be very useful to create more complex policies. Typically, several data points are needed to identify a person from a GDPR standpoint, for example. Logical operators can help you to build DLP policies with and or conditions. A quick example would be to scan for American Express or Visa or MasterCard numbers and also have dates and names in the proximity of the credit card numbers. Machine learning, document fingerprinting, or exact data matching are other techniques that can be successfully used to minimize false positives. Integration is the final point of the presentation. You can offer zero-day support for new macOS versions, have a lightweight agent, do a really good job with false positives, but if you will still have a hard time getting value out of your DLP solution if the tool doesn't integrate with other solutions in your technology stack. This is why you should take into consideration at least the following integrations. Identity providers like Okta or Azure AD for single sign-on. It's more secure and convenient to integrate with a single sign-on solution than to create and maintain local admin accounts on the DLP platform. Directory services like Microsoft Active Directory or Azure AD to maintain group membership in one centralized location, then synchronize it with your DLP and other solutions. SIM integration because you don't want your DLP tool to be an island of data where all the DLP incidents live. You'd want those incidents to end up in your Splunk, Alien Vault, Curator, or Securonix instances, where you store the incidents from all the other security tools that you have in the organization. A RESTful API to edit policies without logging into the graphic user interface of the platform, and of course, for automation. And last but not least, integrations with MDM solutions like Jamf for agent deployment and then health monitoring of the agent on the computers. Since we got to uh, the end of our session, I would like to sum up what are the key points to consider when looking for a DLP solution. Zero-day support, the number one challenge of every Mac admin then a tool that leverages Apple's latest technology. We talked about kernel extensions and system extensions, M1, M2 support, and Vision API. Have a strong relationship with Apple and listen to the Apple community. A lightweight agent with a very small footprint to not affect performance. Then have support not just for cloud applications, but also for physical devices. Have multiple ways to reduce false positives and of course, integrations with third-party applications. If you would like to talk more about DLP, you can find me on endpointprotector.com, on the Mac Admins Slack community, or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to talk about DLP and hopefully offer some useful advice to prevent you from complaining about DLP on the Mac Admins Slack channel. Thank you for taking the time to join this session. Enjoy JNAC 2022 and see you next year.